Nobody wants to hear somebody come to criticize them that the effort they have done for 20, 30 years has been misguided. It's not their fault, unfortunately. It's a system, though. What happens with this wonderful, wonderful discipline of musical phenomenology is we're dealing with the most basic, the most universal dynamic principle ever. In our case, in the realm of music, realm of sonic art, but it's a universal thing, which is, which is tension release. It's the sun, the moon. Breathing is inhaling, exhaling. And the heart is uh, we say in Spanish, systole, diastole, which is pum, 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 pum. Contraction, relaxation. Yep. So when we go flat line, there is no tension release. When happens? We're dead. That's why music is dead now, doctor. Ah, okay. Because there is no awareness of how to convey the life, the contraction and decontraction, you called it, of the heart of the inhaling, exhaling. If we prepare a poem or just a prose, just a writing, but the person that says it, imagine if he reads that which is of transcendent content without any breaths or without respecting any kind of intonation things or without putting the accents correctly where the words are supposed to be accented or putting any a punctuation or nothing, what would happen to that great writing poem or prose? What would happen to the content of that? It will become trash. Correct. That is why we live in music now. Because it goes worse. It goes worse. I can do circular breathing. I can play and... I can play and breathe at the same time. It's called circular breathing, but I'm doing it through two different conduits. I accumulate air here in this bag while I'm, and I'm inhaling through the nose. To my knowledge, a singer cannot do circular breathing because it all goes through the throat. It's only one conduit. You cannot exhale and inhale at the same time. True. You cannot be pregnant or not pregnant at the same time. I agree. You cannot be 50 or 25% pregnant and 75% not pregnant. No, no. Yes. You cannot be kind of symmetrical. <laughs> you are yeah, exactly. or you are not. Yeah. So the, our yeah, realities yeah. are like that. And perception is one of those. Our brains, and you can correct me, please, is not built to deal with more than one thing at a time. We think that we can. No, but we cannot. But, I uh, believe what we do is we jump our attention exactly. very quickly from one thing to another. But That's we true. cannot we cannot digest yeah. our full focus, our full attention cannot be but in one thing at a time. That's yeah. why we cannot deal with fragmentation. That's why we cannot transcend F not experiencing something as a unity. When there is a chord and I'm out of tune, there is a duality. My perception will ask, where do I put my attention? Into this chord, which is in tune, or this flute, which is flat? Yeah. Fragmentation. I'm out. I cannot transcend. I have fragmented the perception of whoever was listening. If the flute comes in and is in tune, then there is what they call in philosophy a monad, a singularity. There's a reduction of the conflict, of the duality, of the multiplicity into a unity, then this can be absorbed after being perceived as a unity, then I can go to the next aspect of the thing. We are not taught this in our conservatories. It is even more tragic than what you mentioned before because you're absolutely right. We not only specialize, but within this specialization, we are being, Margaret used this term, we've been educated until imbecility. Wow, okay. <laughs> 
that's harsh, which but is, probably true. Which is, which is in, in the case of music, for, for example, we go for what is so primary. Because, listen, I mean, it's undeniable that it is something impacting to exercise anything at a very, very high level of sophistication. Somebody plays the violin at a very high level, you go like, or a piano. But like Celi Bidaki, I would say it's a very primary thing. It's a very primary. Yeah. yeah. You, you can be affected. Yeah. And even can be emotion. You know, oh, but we're not talking about, we're talking about something much, much, much more elevated than that. Then, yeah. in order to do that, Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli does that play in the, the piano. Because he knows not only the nature of the phrases, there are laws that govern how a line should be phrased so that we can understand beyond understanding. We can perceive the nature of the message within that phrase. Otherwise, the, that message gets lost. That's why music now, people don't even want to listen to classical music because literally we're again like that guy talking without putting the accents in the right place or without respecting the, the, the punctuation marks or any of that. So it becomes rubbish. You say in England, you know, it's like, it's a bubbling thing. You yes. See? Now, now, if I respect and I exercise the articulations correctly and they are in tune and they're not fragmented too slow that if an, an acoustic that is dry, the tones get disconnected from each other, we're fragmented, and not as fast as I am in a church or a temple with huge resonance, and I go so fast that all the, what he calls epiphenomena, all the content gets smashed out. My brain, I have a problem with our times. We live a time in which fragmentation of perception has become the norm, which is an absolute catastrophe. I yes, would say. literally. It's, it, yeah. it, it's an aberration. If yeah. you see the commercials, if you see even the teasers for the movies, they, they, are horrible. they go so fast. Yes. Doctor, then I have to stop and see, oh, now I can I can absorb the information that was contained in that second. Now I can keep or have to put it in slow motion. Sometimes even the words that they put, they go so fast that I don't have even time to read them. And it's the post MTV generational thing which video is everything is bombarding, 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 so much so that at the end we don't get anything. They don't get that. We have become accustomed to that. So our perception cannot be challenged beyond the point of experiencing unity. If we do that, we fragment the experience. We are out. There's yeah. no transcendence. There's so, not a chance for us to transcend. So I need to know the principles upon which I can convey the connectivity of this phrase within the acoustics in which I am based on the energy that I put in my instrument dynamically meaning loud or soft where to emphasize which notes all of these things and the other thing is there's no space for memory the musical experience is an here and now experience it cannot be based on what i did before or bring a background of memory if it if it if if it relates to what i think it should be i'm not free i'm imposing criticism over the experience i cannot transcend the same thing happens with that with those people who listen. And that's the third thing I didn't mention when I said we need a masterpiece, number one. We need instrumentalists or performers that can go beyond just playing correct notes or playing beautiful sounds. Yeah. We need also listeners who are willing to experience freedom while they listen and to let their attention be focused on what is being conveyed and to forget all the trap of their memories of the rec records that they heard and the CDs and everything, or the interpretations, which is a no-no. There's no interpretation in music. There's music or no music. Yeah. I cannot change yeah. the topology of the structure of a piece by Mozart, Bach, or anybody. I cannot interpret. No, I can either exercise that to bring that into fruition or not. So... That is what is important. Not only the tragedy is that we don't study other disciplines. Within the musical academy itself, uh, 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 the, 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 the educational system, 
We don't even teach what is fundamental to music, which is what we're talking about. Basically, to me, to think about music and to think about especially people that are that that will spend half of their lives being educated in a conservatory or being there for 15 years of their life uh, practicing, uh, learning. Uh, okay, so what are what are they doing there then? If if it's not learning the basic building blocks of how music works, what are they doing there then? I need to clarify something. It sounds like I'm beating down the system. No, I'm trying to offer a compliment, something that will enhance the very good things you're doing, which is how to play an instrument. It's hard to answer this question. I would come back probably, probably to something you mentioned before, which is a specialization thing. Before, composers were virtuosi as well. All the great composers we admire, they were great, great, not only instrumentalists and performers, but they were improvisers. So as a consequence of in the 19th into 20th century, especially the 19th century, the division of the specialization of the composer as composer and not playing, and the performer as a performer and not composing and not being creative, that brought us a consequence that the creative mind went this way and the playing performing mind went only that way. And that's the only thing they do, perform. I believe that is also a consequence of our times. The most important elements have been left out in what we glorify, what we reward, what we seek, what we celebrate are superficial things. It gets worse. There's this beautiful anecdote by uh, by Hacha Heifetz. There's yeah. this lady that came to him and said, Maestro, Maestro, I will give my life to play the way that you do. And he answered, you know, you know the, the cliche. He says, Mademoiselle, that's exactly what I've done. <laughs> 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 Point being, we value perfection to such a way that it goes in detriment of what music is. The great Glenn Gould desisted from playing concerts live because he said people don't come to enjoy music. They come to see the maestro make mistakes. It's funny because most of the things you're talking here, maybe 90, 95% of musicians will brush me off because of many reasons. Uh, one of them, the truth is also some hard, sometimes hard. Nobody wants to hear somebody come to criticize them that the effort they have done for 20, 30 years has been misguided. It's not their fault, unfortunately. It's a system, though. I have been through the same system, and I did not allow the system to beat out the reality of what is most important in my life, which is the best music I can ever do. And in order to become the best musician I come or to be able to convey the highest level of expression in my craft, in my calling, is by pursuing these things. As humbling as they are, as deep and uneasy as they are. So if I understood well, basically there was a moment in time due to several like social historical reasons that made the yeah the music industry of that time to decide that some of them would be better at basically becoming better at their instruments and some others would become better at basically composing and the two areas were separated and i don't know if it, it was an industry thing or just a social thing or cultural thing you see doctor there's so many things we have lost when mozart finished a sonata and he was playing something later and they're not in the same key. Now we go from one to the other, no problem. Back then it was considered rude to the ear to finish something in C and go play something in F. No, he had to make an interlude Wow! from the C he finished, make something there on the spot, improvise. Yeah in order to go from the realm of the experience of the home key of C major, yeah. to be able to prepare the ears and the souls and, 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 and the consciousness of who was listening to him into the F now, I can play an F. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> now, when we talk about tension release, which I mentioned a few seconds ago, Again, that is the absolutely most fundamental thing. If I play...
y en el sing do 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 ri re re do ti do re re fa do ri ri that makes sense because here I'm in C major I'm in the home key which is rest mm -hmm. if I go here tension 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 attention that demands a resolution here ah Why that is, I have a whole TED conference like thing that I want to do on that. I call them TED conferences from my living room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In which I can explain or I can share, not explain, I can share extremely heavily compelling elements that suggest me of how our perception and why our perception determines, receive this. A tension that demands then, to be resolved. Okay, that's a different. Yeah. That's a that's a different conference, a different lecture. But yeah, exactly. check this out. If I do this, yeah, in the realm of the one, which is a fundamental, which is rest. I'm singing wrongly the notes that emphasize the tension and the opposite. Now, there's a way to do this right. This is called appoggiatura. And I did it. La so fa de mi fa so so do lo si si. I do another note which is tension out of the realm of the chord that I'm playing, but as a as a as a tool of putting tension that 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 is relieved. So what all I'm doing is managing yeah. the principle of tension and relief correctly, so that. We can receive, we can perceive something that can take me somewhere. You know the example that I that I give many times? And this is very, very sad. It's very sad. Imagine a calligraphist yes. that spends his or her whole life developing the incredible exuberance and fineness of that. And then you go and you see this and you see the aesthetic value of that visual expression. And you go like, wow, master, that is fantastic. Now, what does it say? And the calligraphist will say, well, I don't know. Yeah. I just, I just paint the letters. I don't know what the message is. That's where we are now yeah, yeah, yeah. with the majority of musicians. And I understand it's not that it's easier to teach what is technique or something again it's extremely hard don't get me wrong i'm not minimizing that my thing is it's tragic that it just stays there playing good and learning how to play an instrument should not go in detriment of the fundamental principles upon music is based and do you see any kind of way out so well yeah I'm, again i'm starting with uh, maestro cristina cosell she's not paying me for me to say this but i'm gonna do an interview with her And I'm going to someday publish my lessons with her. We need to understand it's not only controversial, but it requires, it requires a mind and a heart that is willing to pay a price. I don't know how many are willing to pay the price. I don't know how many musicians playing classical music were willing to pay the price that I've paid when I went to school to learn jazz or to pay the price to go study with Ravi Shankar and great other... Rajiv Ji and Omya Das Gupta and Hari Prasad Chaurasia to study Indian music or to pay the price to get in a plane and go to Baltimore to one-on-one -on -one study with Maestro Mark and Thakar on my own money, paying my own, my own uh, hotel and my own airfare yeah. to go meet with them, to have classes. So as to practically, I can see if what I'm understanding from his book is correct. I don't know if people are, I don't know if people are willing to pay the price out of conformism. It's very disappointing to hear that you don't have 
in your formal education any way of uh, getting around this. So let, let me probably rephrase this real quick. And I, it is so beautiful. I saw her two days ago in a, in a beautiful planet choir they did called uh, Somos Más Que Dos. It's just beautiful song. And the Escola Cantorum of Maestro Alberto Grau and Maestro Maria Guinan did with Escola Cantorum and people that through the many years of that choir are all over the world. And, and you can see, it. I might probably put the, the, the link later so they can see it. It's, it's a planetarium uh, uh, choir now. That maestro, and again, I started musical analysis with her in 1978. I tell you I'm not 15 anymore. <laughs> and she asked us a question. Because her husband, Maestro Roberto Grau, was very influenced by, by Chely Bidaka. Chely Bidaka used to go to Venezuela. And uh, we have a connection with him because his sister used to live in Venezuela. My own brother, my first maestro, Michel Eustache, exposing me from uh, uh, Peter and the Wolf and, and of uh, Prokofiev to, to uh, uh, orchestral guide for the youth of, of Benjamin Britten to, to classical uh, uh, traditional Venezuelan things, to Christian hymns that we sang at the Baptist church in Caracas, to Renaissance medieval things. Uh, that we sang Palestrina, Juan Cabezón, Juan de Lencina, all these things, to, to Venezuelan. He put me to play the cuatro since I was nine while I was playing the recorder. And I did my first recording with them, professional, in a studio when I was 12. Imagine wow. that. So this guy was like a Renaissance guy with the music, you know? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I was exposed to Eric Dolphy. When you were 12. Yeah, exactly. You see? So, I okay. mean... Okay. This is amazing. Maestro Guinan, when I was, Maria Guinan, we were studying uh, musical analysis. She put in the context of all these things that I said that I was already kind of aware of phenomenology and, and, and musical phenomenology of Shelly Vidak and knowing that there's something else, something more than just technique to convey something beautiful. <laughs> like we say in Spanish, exactly. beautiful, you know, beautiful. She asked us in that class, she said, that crescendo in bar 38, she said, she asked, Give me a musical reason that justifies that wow. crescendo there. Don't tell me it's because it feels good. Don't tell me it's because my teacher taught me to do it like that. Don't tell me it's because tradition demands me to do that. Give me a reason that justifies musically that crescendo there. Well, let me tell you, the fundamental of that question took me 35 years to start finding answers to that question. You wow. see, I'm, I'm the stubborn yeah. guy. I have electronic things and I've been doing this since 78 and cuatro since I'm nine and, and flute since I'm uh, 14, 15, but I started with recordings since I was nine. So all these things, I don't let them go because I cannot have peace until I can act upon them and kind of have a connection once I'm aware of something, I'm screwed because I have to go and find answers. That's what makes your approach to music so unique is that uh, you're always looking for something else, like like seeking. It's like an endless, like um, you're you're a seeker. You're, yeah, I don't know but, what but, you're but, actually like, looking like, for. But like but... my teacher, Aurel Nicole would say, it's really important to seek, but it's really important to find. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love finding too.